Okay, you're very welcome along to this week's Golf Weekly. There is much to discuss. Project Bryson nears completion, a bulldozing type win in Detroit on Sunday. Brooks Kepka has thrown shade on the whole thing, mind. If only they could be partnered in the Ryder Cup in September. Alas, that will not happen until 2021 at least. The Ryder Cup postponed. We will be joined by European captain Padre Carrington on today's pod. As well as that, we will have from the Spawell driving range today, Peter Laurie. Hello. Hello, Joe. How are you? Very well. Fionn Davenport, hello to you. Hey, Joe. And uh, Nathan Murphy, we missed you the last uh, week or so. You're back. How are you? Oh, it's good to be back. Bryson brought me back. He sure did. Well, I mean, this is bumper. The uh, brand new OTB app, by the way, is where you can get all off the ball content. Just search OTB Sports. Nathan, I know you were looking at the stats. Uh, Golf Weekly Oof. numbers, surprisingly, it sounds like I'm joking here, surprisingly excellent. We're, we're, we're a runaway success, it turns out. We're just too modest. We're, like you say, surprisingly, we should know at this stage that our listeners are loyal, and when we ask them to try out something new, they'll they'll back it up. We need to reward them in some way over the next while. We need to try and get out and have some sort of a golf classic, uh, socially distanced one somewhere along the line between now and the end yeah. of the summer. Agreed, 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 agreed. And um, I'll get back to tweets next week. I've been sort of ignoring tweets. I don't, I'm not necessarily necessarily sure why. Sorry, so. we love our loyal listeners, but just yeah. don't bother interacting with us because <laughs> really, really, Joe, Joe just looks at him and goes, this guy, why would I care what your opinion on this is? Uh, I'm not sure why it happened, but uh, from next week at Golf, at golf Weekly OTB, we will get through a whole host of tweets. So, Patrick Harrington is going to join us in about 20 minutes or so. Let's kick off the discussion on, wow, I mean, there's a lot going on. I should mention before I forget to do it, European Tour is back this week, uh, tentative steps back into the world of golf with the Austrian Open. And then on the PGA Tour, we'll talk about this later on. Uh, we're at Muirfield Village uh, for the next two weeks. If you're, you're just kind of confused in that, the, the dates, they're talking about Muirfield next week and Muirfield two weeks. Basically, there is the Workaday Charity Open at Muirfield Village this week. It's a PGA Tour event. And then next week, it's Jack's Tournament at Muirfield Village, again in Dublin, Ohio, at the Memorial. And lots of the players are going to play two weeks on the spin, even though uh, COVID is sharply rising in Ohio. So that's what's going on in broad terms. We'll come back to that later on. Let's start with last week. Bryson DeChambeau. I have this uh, broken up into three categories. There is uh, Bryson DeChambeau versus cameraman. There is uh, Bryson DeChambeau and his performance, his game. And then there is Bryson DeChambeau and Brooks versus Bryson and, you know, Malachy Clerkin's piece in the Irish Times and a sense of uh, questioning about, well, uh, Brooks's transformation and the extent to which he is or isn't being asked about that transformation, the way he might be. Bryson's yeah. transformation. Bryson's, Bryson's, Brooks, yeah. Brooks just, Brooks just wakes <laughs> up in the morning looking like that. Yeah, <laughs> Bryson's, Bryson's transformation and the extent to which he might be asked about that in another sport and maybe isn't being asked about that in golf. They're my three uh, mm. categories. Can we start with his game firstly, and that will bring us to the Brooks situation and we can deal with the cameraman and uh, our general perceptions of Bryson uh, thirdly. So his game, uh, let's start with the obvious, Nathan. He averaged 350 yards off the tee. He took this Donald Ross creation and drove a bulldozer right through it. He did, but also with a bit more craft than he's been given credit for. Last week was the best putting performance of Bryson DeChambeau's entire career. So the focus is on obviously on the bulk and how he's improved off the tee, but maybe it is all linked together that the confidence he's getting from the, what he can do off the tee and all the attention that that's garnering is improving his putting performance, but he didn't just win because of hitting, was it 14 drives over 350 yards, 16 drives more than twice anybody else, 10 yards longer on average than Cameron Champ who was the second longest. And Cameron Champ at the start of the year would have been sort of known just as, as an out-and-out -out bomber, had that more than anything else, but you know would win the odd tournament here and there because of that talent. Whereas Deschambeau now is hitting it 10 yards per hole, and so pretty much a club per hole longer mm. than Cameron Champ. And is backing it up with his putting. And like, I think we should talk about this briefly first, just how good he has been on the greens. So he, last week, he was the first player since the stats started to be collated to lead both in strokes gained off the tee and strokes gained putting, 
which is just insane. And he has put himself, and I'll be interested in what Peter says and what Podrick says, but he's put himself in that category, right at the top of that category, alongside McElroy and Dustin Johnson, that when they play, put well, they will win. So his length is mean he's going to be always there, thereabouts. But when he puts well, he's going to win tournaments. And if you look at the other players who've had similar stats to what he's had over the past few weeks, they all win multiple times per season and all win major championships. So if this keeps going for the next three months and he's hit a hot streak at just the right time, if this keeps going over the next three, four months, he's justifiably favoured mm. for the majors between now and the end of the year. Yeah, his strokes game put in 1.9 all week and it was two point something on Sunday, which is nuts. I mean, he holds some monster puts. Uh, to give people a sense of the other drives out there in the top 10. So Wolf was averaging 326 yards. Kevin Kisner, for instance, 300. Danny Willett is 312 yards. Terrell Hatton is 294. So, I mean, by a distance, he was ahead of them. It wasn't just like it was the course on a given week. Uh, Peter, you were uh, skeptical in some respects over how his body might handle all this. That doubt is still there. But even how he might control this power. I mean, this was seriously impressive. It, it was very impressive. And, and watching it, and I watched quite a lot of it over the weekend, it was superb to watch. Um, he got up there and he smashed it as hard as he could. But his accuracy level with the driver was amazing. Um, some of the tee shots he hit, especially down the 72nd hole, just superb. Like he, that's not an easy tee shot. Um, and he, he never missed that fairway. There's water on the left. If you push it right in the rough, you're going to struggle. And he just bombed it down there. Um, so his confidence is sky high. And I agree with Nathan. Um, when this guy is on, he's going to be very, very hard to beat. The only thing, as I said to you, I worry about is having that much um, intake of protein and protein shakes and stuff like that, how long it can last having to carry around that extra weight in different tournaments over a period of time. W will he burn himself out? Mm. Fionn? Um, of the many remarkable things about his play this weekend is this little, <laughs> this little one. On a number of occasions, he broke shot link. So you know the laser system that, that they use for determining strokes gained because his drives were so close to so many greens that the system was reading them as approach shots rather than drives. And so it looked, if you look at the stats before they got adjusted, that his iron and wedge play was a lot worse than it actually was. Uh, and in fact, no, because like, I mean, he had like 100 yards into most greens. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, like he was playing with Kevin Kisner and... Who, he, who ended up third, but he said to Manta Balionis, he's changed the way the game is played. Now, we've heard that twice before, when Tiger Woods won in 97, when Jack Nicklaus won in 1965. Mm. Like, for someone to actually go, I mean, like, you can allow here, you can allow for, like, this is a guy who hit a 367-yard drive on the, on the 18th on Sunday. Um, but, like, the, the counter-argument is that he single-handedly going to make the PGA finally adjust equipment and golf balls to pull back on distance, that this is the weight that he will carry, that because of Bryson DeChambeau, the PGA will finally get the finger out and make golf you know, to kind of rein in the distance. Hmm. I was just looking at the difference in him as a player. So driving distance across this year, he's 323 yards. Hmm. If we go back two years, 2018, he was still driving the ball on average 300 yards, which put him 25th on tour. So he's yeah. picked up on average 23 yards. Now, there's some holes where he's obviously hitting it 350 almost in the air. Um, interestingly, his driving accuracy, he's 112th on tour this year. So I know he's finding lots of fairways, but actually statistically, he's 112th on tour. Greens and regulation, he's sixth. Some of his irons, he was completely missing the green. Like, well, geez, when he even dials them in, which you suspect is the next um, step. But he's driving accuracy, 112 on tour, Peter. Uh, we touched on this with Paul McGinley on Monday. Uh, Bryson's obviously looked at the stats. DeChambeau's looked at the stats. You don't need to find every fairway. He's 112th on tour, but distance he's number one, and he's uh, figured it out. That is the formula. Yeah, but you just have to tell me there, he's gone from 300 and 
300 and odd yards to 323 now. Yeah. That's two club difference going into every hole. Mm. So he's got majority of the times, rather than a drive in an eight iron, now he has a drive in a wedge. Mm. Um, and with loft and the way you can spin the ball now, you can hit it out of any lie and stop it on the green. The only greens that you're going to struggle to do that are A, tight flags, or B, a US Open. Yeah. Um, and w- we haven't even seen a golf course set up in any way difficult as of yet uh, on the US Tour. So let's, let's just hold out for a, a difficult setup golf course. Um, and, but the, you know, you, go sorry, on. I was going to say, like 112, again, doesn't sound great. But it's still well ahead of where Rory McIlroy is. It's well ahead where Brooks Kepka is, Justin Thomas is. That none of those long hitters are in the top 100. So actually, of those ultra long hitters, he's the most accurate of them as well right now. Great point. Okay. And I, to be fair, Peter Hilton Head. I mean, he he's actually navigated his way around some tight courses of late and had top 10 finishes. Tight golf courses, yeah. And and he's 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 got the driver out the very odd time and boomed it out there. But he's hitting a rescue down the fairway. And look, this guy is on form. He has huge confidence right now. Yeah. And that confidence is going to bring him, it's going to be a, like a little wave, Jordan Spieth wave, until something goes wrong. Because if he slightly gets it wrong, swinging at that speed, he's going to hit it off the planet. Um, and right now, he's got everything perfect. But we'll wait and see. I mean, we should say it again. He's won six times on the PGA Tour. He did win three times in a single year. So it's not like this is a guy who was a dud mm. and has now suddenly become very good. But he's doing it in a different way. Uh, let's talk about the perception of all this then. So certainly from an Irish perspective, Maliki Clerken on the Irish Times wrote a, a very interesting piece. Very hard to disagree with any of it. Effectively, he said, look, if this transformation in a player's body had happened in any other sport, there'd be more questions. That's not happening in golf. Now, to what extent it's possible for the journalists to really get their teeth into him in the current press conference setup? I'm not entirely uh, sure. And Maliki in his piece said, well, maybe they're behind the scenes they're asking about this as opposed, as opposed to, you know, up front in a press conference. And then Brooks Kepka. I mean, it was just, Geez, I, I, I just couldn't believe it when I saw it. <laughs> Bruce Kepka. So um, Kenny Powers is a fictional baseball character. Eastbound and Down is the show. It's a comedy. It's a great show. Is it good? Okay. Oh, it's fantastic. So Brooks Kepka, without referencing Bryson DeChambeau whatsoever, even though this is 48 hours or less after Bryson's win, he tweets a gif of Kenny Powers' baseball character beefed up, coming over to a camera and slapping it down. And the line underneath is Kenny Powers' response to steroid allegations. Now, a libel law says implication is as good as being explicit in what you're saying. So uh, judging by the 20,000 likes last time I checked this tweet had and all the responses, people were pretty clear about what he was talking about. And he may well say, oh, it's just a joke or it's nothing to do with anything. But people knew what he was doing and he knew what he was doing. So, I mean, like your reaction to that, Nathan, because... I saw. I thought this is going to be this is going to blow up now. It hasn't quite blown up. I mean, maybe it's a failing of the golf media. The most common story I've seen in the U.S. since Kepka's tweet is, "Oh my God, we got to pair these two the next time they're in the same tournament." As opposed to, hmm. has a player just called out a fellow player here? Uh, yeah, and if a player has called a fellow player out, is that a big deal, or do they just think, "Well, it's all a bit of a laugh." Sure, if he is, he is, and. What harm? It's incredibly difficult to comment on for, as Maliki touched in his piece, for the libel laws in our country are very different from the libel laws in America. And I don't think an Irish golfer could tweet something like that about another Irish golfer and may well end up facing consequences for it. And I don't want to go on the defense of Bryson DeChambeau, but if you're trying to play a devil's advocate, is Bryson DeChambeau massively more bulked up right now than Brooks Kepka is? Is it just that it is this transformation in the space of six months? Like, was this body always inside him? He just didn't work hard enough to get it. I'm sure that's what he would like to say. And it's, it's just, like, he, and again, maybe this is part of the plan. Like, he's very good at talking about it. So everybody knows about this. It's in every press conference. He brings it up. He wants everybody to know what he's eating for breakfast, literally for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm-hmm. Part of DeChambeau's way of operating from the scientist through to this is he tells everyone everything he does or certainly 
what he wants to portray that he does, his version of what he's doing, so that he looks like some sort of a genius. So whereas other players just go around and might change and just keep their head down and see does anybody notice. He makes sure everybody... So it's not like he's hiding this change. It's not like he's come out and, oh, Bryson, you've put on a lot of weight there. Oh, really? I, I hadn't <laughs> noticed. He wants everybody, he wants everybody, everybody to know how he says he has done this. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I haven't answered your question there at all. I just, no, you, no, you have. I, I like, because here's the thing you go on Twitter now, you look at the responses to the Kepka tweet. There is, you know, be, because we look at sport and it's full of uh, cheating. We are all inclined, uh, particularly again the post Lance era, to be ultimate cynics because we, you know, everyone's been made fools of numerous times over. So the starting, most people are saying he's got big, therefore guilty. Like that's kind of the the easy analysis, and we could do that from here. The fact is, none of the four of us know what's happened. None of us are hanging out with Deschambeau. Um, but I, I looked at the numbers. So, and this is, to be fair, I should say, this is off his Instagram page as much as anything in terms of he's been updating on this for a while. So, and I'm, I'm, I've converted this to stone. I don't know, am I, am I the only person that when someone says a pound's weight, I, I just still just don't know what that means. I'm, I'm stones. So he was 195 pounds at the start of 2018. That's 13.9 stone. So 2018, he's 13.9 stone. Uh, you go October 2019, which is a year and 10 months later. He's gone from 13.9 stone to 15 and a half stone. So he's picked up just under two stone in 22 months. About two stone in 22 months. Then again, looking through his numbers and his posts, uh, July of this year, he's gone from 15 and a half stone to 17 stone. So he's, since October of 2019, picked up one and a half stone. And that's the, the three stone that we're talking about. Now, this has been reported in the media as DeChambeau has picked up three stone of pure muscle in nine months. That's not what's happened. Now, that's not me saying there's nothing to see here. I'm just saying, like, this is the received reporting has become three stone in however many months of pure muscle. Uh, And I was talking to somebody on the basis of anonymity, who is uh, working in the world of uh, fitness and as a very, you know, in, in the world of golf too. And you know, that person was making the point, like, he's definitely not single digit uh, body fat percentage here. He is chubby. You know, he, he has a belly on him. He has his jawline is not, you know, chiseled out there. His face is, is chubby. So he's put on lots of fat as well. And that person was making the point, it's actually not possible to put on a load of muscle and not put on some fat as well. So he's anticipating DeChambeau's weight will go down in the coming months as he sheds some of the fat. Uh, that person couldn't say if this is impossible or not. You know, you, the, the thing you will see people say is not possible to do all this in the time. Um, so I don't know. Uh, none of us know. Um, and that's sure. just to add on. Someone can pick up the bat on from there. That's, I just wanted okay. to put the numbers out there. So it's not, I, I it's think, not three stone of muscle in, in, in six months. But it's also worth pointing out that, is that there's a lot of focus been put on the amount of weight that he's put on whether it's muscle and like, you don't need to be like a fitness specialist to know that he's got a belly, yeah. you know, but like Robert De Niro put on 60 pounds to play Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull in the space of X months. It's not, it's not unheard of to put on weight. It's not, that's not the issue. And, and like, and, and as you said, Joe, DeChambeau makes, it, re, it wants you, he made that whatever it was, like a 14 minute video of himself going through all his things. And like, he invites everyone in and, Kind of reminds me of, um, I remember when David Brailsford first came out with the marginal gains philosophy and they were like all open and it was all like, here, this is how we do it. This is, this is all it. But what's interesting about DeChambeau and I wonder, this, I think that people who really know about the golf swing better than I would, is more, it's not so much the weight, it's the 12 miles per hour of ball speed that he added. And, he, and, and this was in December of 2019 where all of a sudden, he makes this massive jump in ball speed. That's the key. Okay. And now he's topping whatever it was. He was topping 190 uh, last week, but he had gone to 185 in December. So before COVID, he had really made this massive, massive jump. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so also as well as another, like he's adding like a whole bunch of miles per hour in club head speed. So 
I think the focus of the, the real question is, is like, how do you get, how do you get this amount of ball speed? How do you make this improvement in ball speed when it seems that that is the thing that every single professional golfer would trade their granny to improve? I, I think, can I just throw my top and his worth in here? Um, yeah. and, and Brooks. Oh, siren going off. Libel lawyer no, no, on the line. No. On the line. <laughs> hold on. Cut, hold on. Cut, cut, cut. My no, phone started ringing. The lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I, Don't I, let I him talk. I, by the I way, by say, the way, Padre Carrington has been a little bit delayed, so we have a little bit more time now, so we can tease this out. Go on, Peter. He's probably tweeting out there some swing video, so it'll probably take say, a say to his minutes. face in half an hour. Yeah, I yeah. will do. Don't worry. Um, uh, right. So initially, I, I, a long time ago, uh, Joe criticised me for slagging off Bryson or, or Brooks for not being the um, sharpest tool in the box. So let's put that aside. I, I personally don't think this Well, you is, didn't, Peter. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> let, let's put this, go to, go to Bryson and, and um, look at what he's done. And, and let's throw Porik in before he comes in, because I'm going to throw his name in the hat. Porik himself will, will admit to this. He, he put on a huge amount of weight uh, before he turned that fat into muscle. Um, and Bryson, I think, is going to do something similar, but it's a work in progress. Um, Bryson is very much, look at me. He, he, he has to be center of attention. He's that type of personality and always has been. Um, he, he brings out the Hogan hat, the same shafted clubs. Everything has to be, look at me. He, he's just that type of person. I, I, I don't think we're looking at a drug situation here in any way, shape or form. I think we're looking at a guy who has researched in how to hit the ball further and swing speed is absolutely number one. But number two, you have to have the weight behind it to hit it. And also then you have to have the technology to match up with that. Right now he's hit the purple patch. He has the swing speed, he has the weight behind it, and he has the technology that's working. Five degree driver, it, 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 it all just works. I think that eventually he will go down the line of putting on a bit more muscle. The actual speed will change a little bit. It'll probably decrease if anything because if the muscle gets in there. Um, and he won't be hitting it as far, but probably hitting it a little bit more consistently. Um, I think Brooks is jumping the gun here a little bit. But my think, as I said to you, my, my kind of top he's worth is, is, is Bryson has gone down a road He's successful right now, but will that last? I, I doubt it very much. Okay. So there's two aspects here then. Uh, Nathan, I'll throw it to you first and, and people can um, jump in then. So when we're having this conversation, like take Malachy's um, piece, he was talking about golf, not asking enough questions. The, the testing situation has changed in the last couple of years, and it's worth mm -hmm. saying that to people. So uh, the PGA Tour have now come on the WADA list. So anything that's banned by WADA is banned on the tour. This is of 2018. And the tour in 2018 as well, they st still use uh, urine tests, but they introduce blood testing as well because that can detect human growth hormone. And also uh, suspensions for recreational drug use are now reported. They weren't for a long time. So uh, the tour has increased testing. That's not to say this shouldn't be a conversation. And that was part of Maliki's point. Agreed. Um, but uh, on Kepka, like, I, 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 he's really gone down in my estimation for the way he's gone about this, you know? And I hope he's really put on the spot by the golfing media when he's finished his round today or at some stage this week. And, it, you know, he should not be allowed just kind of give a smirk and say, ah, oh, you know, just a joke or it's not about anyone. It's, you know, I, you're reading too much into it or, or a glib line. Like, because th it's too serious an allegation for that. It's too serious if you're DeChambeau and your name has been dragged through the mud by a fellow pro. And it's too serious for the sport as well, which is now going to see, I suspect, over the next 10 years, lots of DeChambeau imitators. Like, I, it wouldn't strike me as a joke. Um, and if Brooks Kepka has something to say, then actually he needs to, in a very serious way, say it, either publicly or to the PGA Tour officials. Not on a... Tuesday, after a Ryder Cup teammate of yours has won and has probably, from their point of view, put in a lot of work and it should be a really good week for them to throw that kind of shade at it in that kind of way. 
and just sit back and say, yeah, that's all I'm going to say on it. So like how, you know, we're talking to golf media. Mm. I think Kepka should be put to the pin of his collar now and, and said, this is really serious what you've just done. So what are you saying here? Um, and I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it will, because as you say, it's built into a, can we pair them together? Oh, wouldn't it have been great if the Ryder Cup had gone ahead? And what would it have been like in the locker room that having another developing rivalry to go with Brooks v. Rory and adding Bryson into the mix is an interesting storyline and one they can develop over the next few years? Like, throwing shade is probably putting it very politely. Like, yeah. He has thrown a huge question mark over everything that Bryson DeChambeau will achieve between now and the end of the year. And there is a strong possibility he goes and achieves a, a hell of a lot. Like, there's no getting away from that. I have no doubt, and if we're asking for people to get in touch on Twitter over this, I have no doubt that almost all the correspondents will be, lads, you've been way, way too soft. His own, his own colleagues are calling him out and you're coming up with sort of glib excuses and trying to go around in a million different ways to find a reason why he shouldn't be questioned over this. Whereas we're not, we're like, I don't know if we're trying to provide balance or just that there may be another side. And also we can't like the alternative is that we just start making wild accusations that we have no basis in. But well, so, Can I interrupt briefly there? So hmm. we can sit back and say, uh, he is big, therefore he's guilty. What's that worth to anyone? If we're supposed to be journalists, we should have more evidence. He's, he's big, therefore guilty. I mean, anyone can type that into Twitter, bang, send the tweet. Okay. Well, congratulations. Yeah. You haven't proven anything and uh we're not for a second saying he shouldn't be asked about it okay he's no, and that, like, that's what that's what that's what does need to happen yeah. like, and he needs to be on the record being asked about it and denying it and therefore when or if down the track things do emerge it's on the record and people have actually stood up and asked those questions but you're right i think what kepka has done has will have huge consequences because everybody's talking about it there's no way the golf journalists aren't talking about it so both of them need to be questioned about this yes. and then like, who else what what is the level of bulking up that is acceptable before your colleagues and your fellow players call you out like there is there is another issue around the pga tour that i just think people don't trust the pga tour when it comes to this i know the the um testing has changed but there's a general i think everyone's attitude in the last six seven years towards governing bodies has changed from Probably the IAAF was the one, and Lamine Diak. There was always a sense, I used to think naively, that the governing bodies wanted to catch the cheats. Whereas it became very clear in athletics, say, that actually it suited the IAAF. And they went out of their way at times, certain individuals within it, to make sure that they weren't caught and helped them along. And I think that's, and you look at the way golf treats and PGA Tour treats its players, mm. it protects them at all costs. So everything that's gone on before with previous players and covers up and players disappearing for six months, I don't think people will ever, despite the testing and despite the, it being an Olympic sport, I don't think people will ever fully trust that golf will hang one of its own out to dry, particularly mm. if it's one of the superstars of the game. And I don't see how they get that back. Mm. I, I think um, I, I agree with Nathan. Um, Joe, I think your point is well made. I think Brooks has a question to answer. You know, to make these kind of like sideswipe allegations is cheap. And if he does have something to say, he should say it or be quiet. And I, I think that's, that's just about basic decency. However, there is a broader point, And I think Maliki Clerken touched on it in his piece is that you're right, the PGA have changed its testing protocol, so they do test for blood for human growth hormones. But what they don't reveal and they keep as a closely guarded secret is how frequently they test or how, yeah. how many players get tested. They won't, they, it, it's, it's, like, it's like the fourth secret of Fatima, this. And listen, uh, Gary Player is on record saying, now a number of years ago, this is nothing to do with Bryson DeChambeau, and saying there are players taking drugs who will get away with it. I mean, now, I, the landscape may have changed, but it doesn't inspire a huge amount of confidence in the governing body of golf in the United States when the PGA keep it a closely guarded secret. How often they're testing, when they're testing, is it at tournaments, do they show up at people's houses and test? I mean, like drugs exist in sport. Performance enhancing drugs are a fact of life. The idea of pretending that they don't exist is nonsense. We all know that. Mm. However, to, I think, to, I, to go back to your point, Joe, I think it's right. I think as journalists, 
it's easy to make silly accusations with absolutely no evidence. But conversely, as journalists, it is incumbent on us to, or I mean, if we could all get to a press conference, is to ask that question. This is like, it's like how often do you test? Hmm. When do you test? Like when you look at the, you know, all the. T I had a look at, at the tests that they've revealed. It's all players that you've never heard of or like lesser known players. And it's all for marijuana. It's like... <laughs> You know, it's such a... And, and the, they're only going to ban a, 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 a non-herd of player. They're not... A, any of the top players who have tested That's positive it. That, for... VJ Singh, had, VJ Singh is the exception for the deer antler spray. That was it. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you look at the list of players and you go, I have not seen any of these players feature in anything. And, and yeah. uh, two of them, and, and I apologize because I can't remember their names. One of them who had battling addiction issues for years, had a slip, smoked joints and then got banned on the back of it. It's not, like performance enhancing drugs are an entirely different thing in the orbit than recreational drugs because nobody in their right mind thinks a smoking joint is going to make you, give you an edge playing golf. But um, yeah, so I, I think that's, I think, the, the, I think to interrogate the PGA on its testing practices, I think is an entirely legitimate course of action. Hmm. Okay. So we're on the transformative it. side of it, Joe, and yeah. like what happens next? Like, again, it's like it's a very small sample size we have with DeChambeau. It's a we're back, what, four or five weeks to golf, and he's been outstanding, and there's not much other sport happening. So he's become this real uh, figure that everyone is suddenly focusing in on. In terms of is this the moment that the golfing authorities change the ball and change equipment? Do, do you think that? what he's doing is is that transformative that it will speed all that up and will actually bring about proper change maybe i um, i, I do don't think so at all because there's now they're struggling to have money in golf and the only money that's coming into golf is through probably manufacturers um and they support the tours substantially and you're going to be shutting them out if you now change equipment um they can't sell the pro v1 that Tiger uses or Bryson uses or whatever, whoever uses it, um, to the Joe Punter who's paying $55 or $60 for a, a dozen balls. Um, the profit margin on them is huge. So that's that right now that's not going to happen because a lot of those companies are struggling because of COVID and things being shut down for X amount of uh, weeks and months. Um, okay. that's, I can't see that happening. Can I ask you all three of you the same question? Is um, and I was as I was trying to find some other reason for Brooks's kind of little throwing a shade. One, as as we know, is he, him and Bryson are previous over. Yeah. He called him out for slow play. He they did a weird thing with the abs. Like who's got the better abs? It was such a anyway, whatever. But the other thing as well is is that because if you look at the thing, it's Kenny Powers confronts Caravan. Do you think that he's also throwing shade at him because of what happened on the seventh when he had the minute long, when he berated the cameraman? That's, that's, that's yeah, that, that yeah. interesting point. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it's a perfect gift then. I mean, it's literally the greatest gift. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's yeah, like yeah, the yeah. double hit. It's the double whammy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about that the then to, to finish off on um, DeChambeau? Because I want to touch on Seamus Power and, you know, Ryder Cup's been cancelled a few other bits. Uh, yeah, we, look, we have to see where this goes. Um, this whole story—it's—it's—it's it's, it's evolving before our eyes. On the cameraman situation, um, nonsense, absolute nonsense by Deshambo. Really bizarre. Yeah, it was an excellent child. It, it's like Matt Kuchar. Matt Kuchar becomes kind of the 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 you know the eminence grease of golf, and Bryson Deshambo is like, hold my beer. You know, it's like, it, it's like, what an own goal. What a stupid thing to do. Like. Is like, of course, what it's a cameraman's doing his job. You took a Sergio swipe in the bunker. He's just filming you. Like, what do what do you think is going to happen? Hmm. You but know, feed into everything else we've been saying that like he is massively self aware of what his and self entitled is and what he's trying to portray to be. So actually, you know, he's uh, again, he's a scientist and he's very thoughtful about things. Whereas actually seeing the other side, he's it, like that. That's not what brand. Bryson is right now. And I thought PGA Tour were interested in building up brand Bryson. Why would you try and destroy that on me? Hmm. He may, there, there's times where he um, has come on the scene and been really 
quite charming, I think, and likable and giving great interviews. And you think there is a nice young man, confident, sure. But geez, when the slow play well, thing, when he blamed the caddies for walking slowly, um, <laughs> was remember was what he did to star. Richard McAvoy. I was um, going to say the McAvoy Porsche. where he showed no class when this was the biggest day of Richard McAvoy's life. He won the yeah. tournament. And DeChambeau showed no class. No. no. He, uh, he goes from being uh, the scientist Bruce Banner to the incredible bull. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, you, you've, you, Peter, you've talked to a couple of people, and I'm sure they don't want their names mentioned, but, you know, the uh, no. re reports I, on him, like Paul McGinley was on the show on Monday and said he'd spent some time in DeChambeau's company and found him very articulate and very polite. You've heard reports to the contrary. Uh, I asked somebody re only recently who had spent a little bit of time um, around Bryson uh, playing in the same groups and stuff like that. Uh, and it's not a player. Um, what Bryson was like. Um, and the reports back were not very complimentary at all. Um, he, and he, he didn't treat anybody with great respect. He was exceptionally all about Bryson um, and couldn't really give a you know what about anybody else, um, and that was before he's hit this purple patch and and a, a little bit of fame. Um, but how does that, so Peter? Think, how does that differentiate him from I don't know seventy percent of all other professional golfers? It doesn't, unfortunately. You're right. It doesn't. Um, yeah. What percentage right. are you in, Peter? Um, well, obviously, I'm in the wrong percentage because I'm here talking to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, we don't even like you the way you behave. I, like, like, <laughs> if you're going to be that. stuck with us, you might as well be nice to us. Yeah, I know uh, that. Were you actually, all, all joking aside, were you, um, were you an inward type golfer when you arrived at a course, like focused on your own thing? Or were you kind of chatty with others and... Um, no, I would have been a little bit of both, to be honest with you. Um, mm. I, I think it reflects on how well you're doing or how well you're playing. Um, you know, that, that breeds a little bit of self-confidence and not, you know, not that you're walking around, but uh, one of my main things when I got out on tour was I talked to everybody. Um, from the fellas sweeping the bins to Tiger Woods. You're not Woods. doing that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not the way you sweep in. <laughs> the person, the person sweeping the bins. But uh, um, uh, look, uh, the tour was a circus, and and everybody is in it. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the players re don't realize that um, it's not all about them. It's it's the big it's the big picture. It employs a lot of people, and you know, they're these guys are working for you and working with you rather than, you know, working against you. And Bryson having a go at a cameraman, it's just really, really stupid. It's, yeah. it's beyond a, um, cause this is the cameraman who actually can show him in a very good light, but he will go out of his way now to pick up on any fault possible that's going on, you know, with Bryson. So, um, to an, to an, to an extent, I sort of empathized, I mean, more so with the cameraman, but like, with DeChambeau, four weeks on the road, golf more than any other sport can just fray your nerves. You lose all perspective. I would hate to see back me over the last however many years at my top five crankiest periods on a golf course when you just hate yourself, the game, the, you know, perspective is out the window. So I sort of like, you know, it, golf can do funny things to your mind, Peter. You'd, you'd admit that as well. But it's just two and a half hours later or three hours later when he's given the interview this bizarre yeah. expectation that mm. you know, the cameraman wouldn't film reality or he's there to protect my brand. You just wish at that stage he had said, oh, heat of the moment. I'm yeah. You know, apologies <laughs> to the cameraman. Dumb move on my part. Just tantrum. Sorry. Look, hands up. Sorry. But geez, the doubling down is, you can't excuse that. That's, that's, that's the part. That's exactly right. I could, um, I could never imagine you losing the head, Joe. Big time. Terrible. Yeah. I've seen yeah. it. In, wor in work as well. Yeah, could do, could do. Wow. But any of us could, any of us could. But I mean, okay. you'd be uh, like, you'd be quick to acknowledge afterwards, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, so, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, Seamus Power. That was heartbreaking on Sunday mm -hmm. night, wasn't it? The pudding. Yeah, yeah. And uh, unfortunately for Seamus, it's sort of the same old story. He gets himself into 
these positions. Not quite as good a position as he put himself in last weekend, but just struggles to finish off the four days, whether it's, it's nerve or whether it's technique. But as you say, the shots that we saw, we didn't see a huge amount of Seamus power uh, on Sunday. There was a lot of missed putts that I think every single one of them is costing them so, so much money and adding so much stress to the next three, four months in terms of trying to pick up a card and pick up invites. And like, I think on Friday night we were discussing it and I said, like, this has <laughs> unfortunately an 11th place finish for Seamus written all over it. And I think he finished 12th, well, 12th. Yeah. 12th yeah. in the end. And he probably just needs that one big week, that one top three finish and then see when, what a bit of freedom brings him and can he kick mm. on from there. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough old slog from. I mean, Conversely, geez. as disappointing. Better, sorry, Tim. Go ahead. I was just going to say, he won't have a better chance. Like, he missed at least two, three-footers. Yeah, mm. that's... Although he, you know, as in the power of positive thinking, which all professional golfers rely upon, otherwise you wouldn't bother doing this, is that he can walk away from this and, and compartmentalize and go, okay, the positives were, I was here. This is where I was. I need to tidy up this little element. But he might, he might also take a huge amount of uh, positives from the whole experience. Hopefully. Sure rare positivity on this podcast <laughs> mm. no, I, 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 I think just because since we had him on the show i've because all of a sudden like he, he's a human being made flesh so you know he, he he's become a very real person like a three-dimensional person in our lives and and as a result you're watching and you're going this is a guy who works really really hard and clearly he's a smart guy and so you like to think or it, it, it just dawned on me that i once asked shane larry at a golf clinic I asked him about something to do with like, oh, how do you deal with like disappointment or when that shot didn't go well or whatever? I can't remember. And he turned around and very kind of gently, he kind of went, yeah, I don't, I don't my, I'm not working that way. I'm not taking those on. I don't take that negative baggage on. I just stick with positives, which seems to me like the ubiquitous uh, mental approach of most successful modern golfers. Yeah. So um, to wrap things up, because I think, when Podrick comes on, we'll just wrap the pod there pretty much so we're not here all day. Uh, European Tour is this week, uh, Austrian Open, and then Memorial. The field is decent. This is the work of the yeah. Charity Open. Justin Thomas is the favorite. Hideki Matsuyama is there. John Ram can go world number one if he wins. Brooks Koepka is there. Jason Alexander Day. Alexander Shoffley is there. Justin Rose. Colin Morikawa is back. Be interesting to see if he can keep things going. Ricky Fowler, etc. Shane Larry is also there. He has missed two of three cuts, two cuts. and finished 60th at the Travelers. Although, uh, he said, I feel my game is really good. I've just struggled on the greens a bit and I need to build up a bit of confidence in the greens, but I feel like I'm right where I want to be. Just on the greens, I need to improve. So that doesn't sound so bad. He's playing with Matt Kuchar and Davis Love III, which is a better draw. And then Graham McDowell is back after his self-isolation period with Scotty Ken Convoy. So you favorite. haven't mentioned the uh, the best three ball out there. Go on. Of Dylan Fratelli, Denny McCarthy, and Nick Watney, the COVID three ball. Oh All yeah. of whom, all of whom are still, <laughs> all three of whom are still testing positive for coronavirus. What? So they put the three of them out together. I thought no you're not allowed to play if you're testing positive. So part of the they're presumed. They are not presumed to be contagious at this point, said uh, Dr. Tom Huspel, the tour's medical advisor. It all seems to fit in with the return to work guidelines uh, within America and within the PGA Tour. So because they were all testing positive, presumably more than two weeks ago at this stage, even though they're still testing positive, it's only 14 days. So they are allowed back to work, but only if they only hang around with each other. Jeez. What wow, could go wrong? Right. What could go wrong? I mean, you know, yeah. yeah, what could go wrong in the country that's breaking, you know, infection records, records. every single day? Um, what's interesting about this week versus next week, I heard the, uh, the American broadcasters, they were talking that the course is set up much easier this week than it will be next week. So the rough is going to be shorter um, and the greens are going to run quick, but not as quick as they will next week, which interestingly enough, allows them to experiment with different flag positions. So flag positions on super fast greens that just, you just couldn't put them, they can do it this week. So it'll be, even though, and by the way, I don't know if you saw any of it this morning. I, I, I was watching the feature groups before we came on. No. Jesus, it looks gorgeous. Holy moly. Hmm. Memorial looks unbelievably beautiful. And so I can't remember what it was. It was like an ex-American retired player. 
who said that uh, the two most pristine golf courses played on the PGA are Memorial and Augusta. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize that Memorial was rated that highly, that it's the most beautiful place. And it looks whatever. The weather's pretty nice, but it looks amazing on television. Okay. They've got rid of the galleries, haven't they? They, mm. they, were, go- they were going to allow, allow 6,000 in or 7,000 in, but they've, they've turned that down. Well, not happening. Not, not happening. They've got 3 uh, million cases of COVID. Like, I mean, can't believe in July I'll be tuning in just to see some sunshine, but that would be one of the attractions. <laughs> well, that's it. Um, so look, that is the pod thus far this week we're going to take a short break and then we're back in a moment with Padraig Carrington okay so we're very happy to say European uh, captain and of course three-time major winner Padraig Carrington joins us uh, great to have you with us so it's um it's it's tough news but Peter Laurie is going to be in, in this conversation <laughs> <laughs> the respect the respect that I get here Porik is just unbelievable I'd say it's, it's going to be about the same respect you give to me Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quid pro quo. So, um, Ryder Cup uh, postponed. Um, what, do you, can you, what was the, was there an overwhelming factor or is it a combination of logistics, European crowd ain't going to travel, you know, unknowables? What, what was the, defi- the, the deciding reason? Look, you could pick any one of those factors. The deciding reason was health and safety, but the logistics behind it were, it was, a, it was really difficult. From my perspective, uh, you know, they were talking about me having 12 picks at one stage. Uh, 12 picks and about 28 players in contention for those picks. That actually, I put the calculation into my phone calculator. It wouldn't work out. It's too big a number. I couldn't read it. So if you have eight picks, say, with 24 people in contention, that's 70, 735,000 combinations of teams you could have. Distinct teams. Whereas if I'm hoping now I'm back to my normal system, I've got three picks and hopefully there'll be maybe five players in contention for three picks. That's 10 combinations. That's all I have. All I have to deal with is 10 different combinations. If it works out the plan, whereas some of the suggestions were given me like, like inordinate, like 735,000 different teams you could have if you had eight picks and 24 guys for it. So you can understand what do we, what if some player gets COVID? Do you bring in subs? Can you imagine turning around to the guy who's 13th? You've just <laughs> rang him and said, you're not making the team. And by the way, will you come and quarantine for two weeks because we'd like you to sit as, the, as a sub? So it, it was, from my perspective, there were so many issues. But I, I actually didn't, I let them make their own mind up because I kind of felt it wasn't my place to get, it, get in the way there. And it's for health and safety, and not just health and safety in September. People are looking at that. Hopefully in September we're sitting here and going, hey, we could have had the right of hope. It's health and safety now of the people who had to go and work, the people who have to travel. There's a lot of things that, that you know, to get this set up, you have to build out the golf course now. Uh, so there was many reasons, but the health and safety was the primary focus. And obviously over the last month, you know, it's been obviously four months ago you could have bet you would have, it was odds on it was going to be postponed. But in the last month, it was, you know, it was coming. Obviously, there was a lot of uh, media attention to it being postponed. But in the last month, it was trying to get all the different stakeholders lined up. And I will say the PGA Tour comes in for a lot of bad press because they're such in such a dominant position. But they're the one who took the biggest hit on this being postponed. They're the one who had less... They have, you know, they have really no, not a big say anyway in the Ryder Cup, but they're the one who moved over the most by pushing the, uh, the President's Cup out. And, uh, you know, they, they are in a dominant position, but they, they, they played ball for the rest of the, for the good of golf and moved the President's Cup. When I saw the news last night, my first thought was, my God, Harrington has to spend another year talking about the Ryder Cup. How are you feeling about it all? <laughs> As as you know, as Peter will know, I don't mind talking. Yeah, uh, no problem talking, none whatsoever. He'll be fine, Joe. Yeah. Are you, you, know, dis- are you disappointed? Are you relieved? Are you what? I I I am I'm very relieved at this stage. Yeah, and and I was I was I was stressed even though I kind of knew it was coming. I was stressed waiting for it, but I, just just trying to put a team together. Like I I would have spent the last three four months and the next couple of months. Getting spending some time with the the younger players, the rookies, getting to know them well. In terms of, I, I Peter will notice. I'm a very busy person when I'm at a golf tournament. I'm always trying to squeeze a little bit more in, a little bit more practice, a little bit more gym time. So 
where I'd be nice and polite and say hello, smile. I don't stop and chit chat. That would not be me at a tournament. Whereas as the captain, I have to do that. And, you know, I've been planning to have a few dinners and a few things with the players over the last number of months. And that wasn't going to happen. And, and like, even stay, okay, I know the players. Even There'll be one or two I wouldn't actually know. But the extended player family, you know, whether it's their wives or their coaches or their caddies, I have to get to know them too. And I, I certainly don't know some of them. So, you know, I would have missed out on all that. But thankfully, with eight and a half months next year, I think, uh, you know, I have that chance to build those relationships. So what do you do now then, Podrick? Do you reset to where you were this time 12 months ago in your plan for the Ryder Cup, uh, being a year out, being 14, 15 months out? Or because of the lay of the world right now and how the PGA Tour is and how the European Tour is, is the next month, 12 months, going to be very different to what you imagined the build-up to a Ryder Cup being in terms of access to players and, and your own, I guess, how many tournaments you'll play? I, 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 I had done all the administration. That was all done. Uh, so up to that extent, I, you know, whether it's what the team room's going to look like, what the what the the team of the team is going to be. God, that was. I don't even know if I got that th pronounced properly. But anyway, <laughs> I I had done all the sort of colours and all the work, the clothing, all that. So that's done. The only thing I have to concentrate on now is the form of the player. That's it. Who I want. Who I'm going to match up. Who's who. Who are building as partnerships. So. That really, we've given the out to everybody for the next six months. You do not have to play. So there's no points in the next six months. So there are players, and this is the thing that people don't realize, there's players who don't want to play in this uh, COVID crisis. And there's players with underlying health issues that we'd never know about who mm. don't want to play. So you don't want to force somebody out there. So come 1st of January, and I know we're, we're hoping things would be better. Nobody can be quite sure. But everybody from the 1st of January, points will count. You can come and play. And it, it, for me, I, we stopped in March. So I would have had this uh, five, six months of play. Okay, I have eight and a half months. But it will be those eight and a half months that I'll be looking at the form of players and trying to match players up. Uh, you know, So as a captain, I get to choose at the European Tour events who, what three balls play. So I can put a young guy in with a, an experienced guy if I want to see how their relationship is. So I can build that sort of up over the over those eight months. That was obviously going to be missing this year. So that I, I, I'm in a good position in terms of the Ryder Cup, in terms of I've done the the legwork on, on the administration stuff, that the boring stuff. Now it's all about trying to get the 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 good stuff, the teams matched up and 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 hopefully assuming that things are are, are clear, we will be able to do that as normal next year. Can you uh, reveal what the TH theme is, or will that be a closely guarded secret? I would, I, I would hope it is. It is a reveal. I, you, you try it, every team oh, captain tries to keep it. Yeah. Thanks Luke Donald. <laughs> oh no! Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Since since you announced one of your captains or uh, not your uh, vice captain picks on Sky Sports, you might as well throw it out here now. And give the lads a bit of kudos. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was all staged, as I told you. I, I did that on purpose, and I'm going to stick to that line forever. Oh yeah, come on. Yeah, it was, I did not slip. I'm come like, on. I, I, yeah, come I, on. I, I have you all fooled in that. Oh yeah, thing. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. P Peter's made really good use of his time over the last few months at Spowell. He's got his buggy out and he's driving up and down at full yeah. speed. So if you do need someone yeah, ordering yeah. next year, yeah. nobody is more practice right now than Peter. <laughs> do, and, do you actually? Uh, I wouldn't put a. Do you actually pick up the balls, Peter? Yeah, you're out there. I do that, everything, Porik. I do oh, everything. I, I have <laughs> photographic evidence of me doing absolutely everything. How's As strong, you well know, I always strong, get my hands dirty. How, how strongly did you consider Peter's candidacy for vice captain? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Somebody of, of his experience. But, you know, I think his wit could be lost on the players. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, Joe. It's not over yet. I'm just yeah. fucking hoping here. <laughs> hoping. That, that is the other side. You know, if I do need a bad cop, you know, if I need that, 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 I could bring Peter along for that. He'd be able to give that bollocking to a player now. But then, yeah. You, I don't you were, know. You were... I, you were talking yeah. about that thirteenth man there a few minutes ago. You know, uh, I thought you were talking about Miguel Angel Martin when Savvy yeah, <laughs> says you're not yeah. playing the Ryder Cup. 
Well, you know, I, I always like to point out, I was, I was the next man in on the points. Well, I, I, in a roundabout way, I missed out on that team by 13,400 13, pounds, it would have been back then. Uh, and I played with Seve every event that summer. He stood over every shot I hit. Because just like Miguel An- Angle Martin, Seve really was, what, like, he didn't want me in the team because I was a rookie. And I, I will say to Seve, he came to me at the end of the summer and he looked at me and says, you know what? It's just not your time. So he, he, was, he was straight up about it. Uh, and, but it was, it was interesting. As I said, Seve really wanted to win. And, you know, he wasn't going to carry, like Miguel had, had done all his qualification early on. And he didn't want, you know, he was out of form at that stage. He obviously was injured. And he didn't want to take any chances. It was, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was tough on him. But it was, Seve wanted to win. And that's, that's the way it was. Well, that's amazing. I had no idea. So uh, for you, was that uh, in any way enjoyable to be hanging out with Seve for a summer or was that just the most miserable pressurized time? I, I, you know what? It was a tough time. And, and, and as we know, Seve probably had a brain tumor at that stage and Seve would have been a hero of mine, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. Uh, you know, he, he was game had gone and yet he'd be trying hard. And Peter would know I wasn't a quick player. And then Seve in the group playing all over the place, like he, he was struggling. Every week we were struggling with the pace of play, the rhythm of the match, the whole thing. And it was, it was tough. I played with him a lot and it was, there was pressure involved in it. And I, I, I would say, I wish it didn't happen to me because it's, it's sometimes like when you meet your heroes. You know, we, we all know that, you know, I, I, I had Seve up in a pedestal, but the only golf I saw Seve play was when he was struggling with his game. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he, can't, he can't have been great company hitting the ball left, right, left, right. Well, that's what I'm saying. It was tough on the rhythm of, the, of our games. It was tough on the fact, you know, he, he was, you know, he's standing over you. And Sevy knows how to stand over you. He, uh, <laughs> but, and, and I have two sides of it. As I said, at the end of it, you know, he was, he was good in the sense that he could come to you at the end of it. And his words had merit you know you know when Seve is saying them whether it was lip service or not not I've seen other situations where, where it hasn't where somebody hasn't been as polite or as good but Seve was great he says you're a great player your time will come it's just not this time and uh you know f- fair play to him and I said but I, I think if you look back at Seve's captaincy during the Ryder Cup he was a hard captain you know if he you know there was players who just weren't in form and Seve would sit them out. That's it. You know, it, there was no, there was no softly, softly about Seve. The Ryder Cup at that stage, and pretty much through his career was his life, Seve. You know, nobody wanted to, nobody had a bigger chip in his shoulder than Seve when it came to, you know, trying to get one up on the PGA, on the US tour, because, you know, for quite a bit of Seve's career, and, and he, obviously Seve's, paved the road for Europeans he couldn't get into US events uh, you know this back in the 80s you know it, it was the US tour it was very much a closed shop they, they opened it up extremely since 2000 so if you're a good player uh, it's actually it's probably easier if you're a good international player to make it to the US tour than it is for a US player at this stage because their only way is through qualifications where ours is through playing well on our home domestic tours, getting into the world events. And if you have a good run in the world events, you'll get a card in the US tour out of them. So it's, it's easier for a good player, no doubt. But they've made it easier to take the best of the world to the US tour. Hmm. Uh, the talk of the golfing world, Bryson DeChambeau, 350 yard drives. Discuss. <laughs> okay, I am going to let you in. This is, this is your inside track here. I'm going to let you, he has you all fooled. So nobody has done this. So I played the Open at Royal Port Rush last year. On the range, there's three people. There's a young German kid, skinny little lad, skinny tall lad. He looks probably six, two or three. And he's cracking the ball out on a cold day into the wind on the range at 191 ball speed. And he's in rainwear. So everything is against you hitting at speed. So I'm on the range and I'm looking at this and, and I'm going, well, that's impressive. And between me and him is Bryson DeChambeau standing on the range. And the kid goads Bryson to have a go. I helped him too because I wanted to see Bryson have a go. So on a cold day with his normal driver in heavy gear, Bryson knocked out 189 ball speed. 
So that's the equivalent of 190, mid 190s. And, and even if you put in five and a half degrees loft, it would easily be 195. So Bryson had the speed. He just wasn't using it. So he hasn't gained any speed. He's just, he's basically, you're looking, at, it, let's Americanize this. You're looking at a guy who was throwing a curveball at 82 mile an hour who said somebody goaded him to have a go at a fastball and he threw a fastball at 92. And he's going, okay, that's not so bad. He's worked on it and now he's at 95 mile an hour. Mm. So he's, he, he's basically had speed. He's played his whole life working on stability of face. Now he's gone for speed. He's always had it. The bulking up, maybe it makes him a bit more stable. But look, I saw it on the range a year ago before all this happened. Nice. He always had it. So the next guy, I tried bulking up for speed. Look, remember, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done every, there's nothing, there's nothing that within the rules that has not been tried with me. Put it like this I've gone fat, I've gone skinny, I've gone speed work, I've done the whole lot. Bryson has that speed in his body. He's just now using it. What it, it is going to change golf. So I've seen this over the years. Up until Rory and DJ in 2011, up until that, every time we had somebody who was longer, okay, they were definitely, de definitely undermined. In the amateur game or pro game, the rest of people would say, ah, look, he's missed that ferry because he's a long hitter. He's missed that ferry because he's, he, he's swinging too hard. Look at him. Every time he hits a bad shot with the driver, we blame speed. Whereas if a short hitter missed a ferry, nobody blames his speed. So you look at, like, Tiger Woods' driving was undermined because he was longer than everybody else. Uh, we had Hank Keeney. They made him, Hank Keeney had to ch change his swing. It's the most beautiful swing, long hitter. But every long, Davis Love was a long hitter in the 80s. He used to hit an iron off the tee because he was afraid of missing fairways with drivers. And being, and being, Peter, you would have seen amateur golfers, a great friend of ours, Noah Fox, who was exceptionally yeah. long of the day. Every time he missed a fairway, the selectors would go, oh, you shouldn't hit driver. And yeah. it, so, and, and it's not something that the masses do consciously. It's an unconscious thing. We kind of ridiculed the long hitters, uh, I, whether by conscious or not. Now, when Rory and DJ come along, they're getting the coverage. People are going, ah, it's okay. You can be a, a long hitter and a good player. And what the Shambo has done and, and what you see on TV, uh, what you have in the range, what you have that thing in the range, the uh, launch, the uh, top tracer. Top tracer. Because the TV coverage is showing the distance the drives are going, it's showing the ball speeds that they're going at. Every kid out there is looking at this and going, oh, I can do that. It's okay to do it. Whereas the coaches would have coached it out of them. If you saw speed in the kids, you'd say, oh, we've got to make you straight. Whereas now they're going, and, and like, Every kid now who's under 16 years of age will at least have the speed that you see Rory and DJ have. It, everyone. They will, a lot of them will have the speed that you're seeing the Shambo have. And, and remember with the Shambo, there's several players on the tour who have more speed than the Shambo who don't use it. Tony Fino is at over 200 mile an hour and he's trying to play at low 180s. Uh, Gary Woodland was seemingly over 200 mile an hour. He, he was even worse than that for years. Now he's at least going at it a bit. And so what DeChambeau has done is he's, he's definitely broken the mold that, you know what, I am going to play maxed out. Now, I'm amazed how straight he is. It's very impressive. But let's be realistic here. He's still about 15% short of what humanly is possible at the moment. So he, he, he's, he's a super long hitter on the tour. But even on the tour, Cameron Champ, uh, Hagee, they both have more ball speed. Fee now, Woodland possible. You know, but they don't use it. There will come a time that we will have guys out on tour who have the champion. Essentially, what I'm saying is, once you have one guy do it, then there'll be four guys, five guys, ten guys, yeah. and in ten years' time, I, I'm just so happy I won't be there in ten. In ten years' time, you're going to have twenty or thirty of these guys, and you can't ignore them. And and at the moment, I know I'm ranting here a little bit. So what? When Rory broke that mold, and he really did in 2011, he took a jump. That allowed the likes of Bubba Watson and J.B. Holmes not be so much of a... They were considered to be... Not, not, freaks. Uh, uh, yeah, freaks and, and, and oddities. We'd look at them and go, oh, you can't play golf that way. 
And think about it. The minute Rory came out playing golf that way, Bubba and JB played a lot better because yeah. all of a sudden it was allowed to play golf that way. You didn't have to be uh, a freak to be like that. Now the kids are going to all be like that. And when you have 30 long hitters in an event, and this is the people will like say, oh, well, I'd see Brendan Todd, who's Brendan Todd, who has won twice this year, has 159. The last tournament I watched, he was 156 to 159 ball speed. I can tell you that's an iron for a lot of these players. That's yeah. how that, that is. And people will say, well, you can win like that. Yes, you can win like that. But when you have 30 long hitters in the field, if one of them gets a good week on the greens, he wins. You yeah. can't comp- you, you can- if, if there was one long hitter, we, it, it would be so rare we would discount it as, as, a, as, a, as a failing that he's long. But when 30, and there's a few of these long hitters on the tour, I've seen plenty, they're not actually, uh, they're not rounded golfers. But on their good week, mm. when their ball is good, when they got it straight, and they have a good week in the greens, they're formidable, they're incredibly difficult to beat. Uh, and we, we're seeing that with DeChambeau at the moment. What's interesting about DeChambeau is he is using that power at the moment and that's getting the coverage. But traditionally, DeChambeau has just struggled with his short game and his putting. And yeah. clearly that's good at the moment. How much is, is the long hitting and the ego that he's getting from that bringing it to the rest of his game? And remember, I was a bit like DeChambeau. I had to do things different to everybody else in order to feed my ego. I couldn't be the same. And DeChambeau, he is living on, I want to be different. That feeds his confidence that he's trying to do it a different way mm. and not follow the rest. He, he cultivates that image. That, that's just such a fascinating answer. I'm going to go back and listen to that again because there's so much in it. That Port Rush story uh, is very instructive because, and we were debating whether to ask you about this or not, because what's happened with the coverage of DeChambeau over the last... Um, couple of weeks is golf's freak he's bulked up he's put on three stone in no time pga tour testing is lax and then brooks kept brooks kepka i mean geez good, good luck to your counterpart as a captain with this situation brooks kepka puts this tweet doesn't mention DeChambeau by name but the implication is clear it's a it's a gif of a comedy show and it's a uh, reacting back i've seen it yeah steroid allegation we've been talking about it so uh, the coverage has been bulked up how he bulked up, we don't know. And now suddenly he's fast and it's that simple. Yeah, look, he, 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 is, he built the story that, this, that the bulking up gave him the speed. The bulking up might have helped him control the speed. It might have helped him stabilize. It might have helped him hit it straighter. But the speed was there. We've seen it. I've seen it. And you can't, on a cold day, 189 with three shots. He didn't have 100 shots. He had three shots and they were like 188, 189. It's, he, everybody has a set speed in them. And it's very hard. Like, I've spent my life trying to find more speed, trying to stay competitive on the speed thing. It's, it's tough when you get to this level. And I can understand why people are saying, oh, well, if he's jumped that much, there's two arguments. If he's jumped that much, is it drugs? Well, the arguments against it are, one, he had the speed, and two, if we compare it to other sports, he's running about 11 seconds for 100 metres. He, he's that's that's he's like fifteen percent behind what's possible in speed at the moment. So you know, if somebody was running at eleven seconds to hundred meters, we wouldn't be jumping out and going, "Hey, hey, he must be taking drugs." He's throwing a baseball at ninety-five mile an hour. Mm. You know, that that's it's not a physically just because we haven't seen it in golf or or the ones we, as I said, go watch Cameron Champ. Cameron Champ has more speed, and he looks like he's hitting a pitching wedge. You have never seen if you watch, I, I, if you stand there and watch him, you've never seen a guy look like he's hitting the golf ball easy, like he just is smoothing it at two hundred mile an hour or close to it. So, Shambo has, has created it's it's a huge marketing ploy. The bulk, the buds. I'm eating this many calories. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. It's unfair play to him. He's creating that, but he's created the monster himself, though. So we'll, you know, it, yes. Can I ask you, because, so you see him at Port Rush, DeChambeau's on a ton of ranges. He's got the track man there, you know, the speeds yeah. are available. So why, like, is, is it that thing that you're saying? It's just like, he's built up this marketing ploy that, like, I would imagine that first name comes to mind, Brandel Chambly would be the first to put a piece out going, he had this speed long ago. And why is that not happening? 
I'm obsessed with speed. I can tell you every player on the tour speed. When I finish a round, I go in and look at what speeds there to compare why they hit it. That this, I know every like. So I will tell you the short hitters, who's efficient, who's inefficient, what they're gaining, what they're not gaining. I have, I have, I, I, I can I, I can claim behind the scenes responsibility for encouraging a recent major winner, not the Irish one, a recent major winner. I played with him and said, I went to some of his backroom team just because I shouldn't have really. I went and said, what the hell is he doing? He's trying to, he's a long hitter and he's trying to play golf like a short hitter. Gary Woodland. Ha- oh, how would you know that? <laughs> yeah. Put, <laughs> put, Come on, put two and two together. <laughs> By the way, hey. It's not I quite Luke Donald, but it's up there. <laughs> can I just yeah. say something? You never did any of that to me. <laughs> but but you, you're, 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 you're a classic case, and we, we've discussed you. You are perfect. Case. Peter was exceptionally straight. So you chased extra yardage. And, and, you know, there's a player, there's a, another player I know. Players will go down this road now, coming up, chasing yardage. It is the worst thing to try and do for your game. You will never be satisfied if you're trying to hit it further. Because if you hit it 10 yards further down the fairway, you'll be standing there wondering, could I hit it 50? You'll always be dissatisfied. And then if your character was like Peter, who always played from the fairway, now you're going to miss the extra couple of fairways. You're in the rough. That's not, Peter, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have known what to do from the rough. Whereas I can play from anywhere. I'm like Phil Mickelson, myself and Phil Mickelson. You put me anywhere. I've been there. I, I can manage. That's my style of play. I don't need to hit all the fairways. I want to hit fairways, but I don't need to hit them like other guys. Whereas somebody who is a straight hitter, you can go, I can list them out. I, I know the guys who chase the speed. You chase a bit of speed. You're never satisfied on the golf course and you're not familiar with playing from those places. Mm. So it, it, it's a big difficulty for those guys. So Bryson DeChambeau will, will make a lot of young kids into great players because of this. And the, as I said, the, the, the likes of the shot tracker and, and, and and the, the, the ball speed coming up all the time will make these guys play with speed, but it will damage some of the current players who now will chase it a little bit. And they, and they might think that you can gain. But I have never seen a player gain on tour. Never. Not truly. So Cameron Tringali was the one that they held out last year. He gained six miles an hour club head speed. Well, he did gain six miles an hour club head speed because the year before he was trying to hit at 80%. And the, the year he came out, he started hitting at, at, at close to his 100%. As it, and this is a little bit like Shambo. The Shambo, he was tr- playing at his, at his 90%. Now he's playing at 100%. So it's not a gain in speed. It's a change of attitude. What, what was your reaction to the Kepka tweet? I, I really thought, I, I, and you know, I have to say, when it comes to the Shambo, I, 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 I think he needs to work on his course etiquette. He has done things on the golf course. And I think because of that, you know, I, I, I've met him personally and I warm to him individually, but then he does things on the golf course. I say, no, you've got to do better. But I think it was really unfair. The, the, any laboring with the, with the, with the performance and drugs really, you don't know his character. So it, it would, you would think it would be out of character for him. He, he's, he's some of his stuff. He's a softer person than people would think. I think he, Everything he's done is very, very explainable. It's very much there in front of you. As I said, the speed was there. The bulk is, is part of it, part of the story. Uh, I, I, I have to go back to another story. When he turned pro, uh, the, Bryson was on the range in Memphis. And myself and Pete Count, again, we seem to be, uh, he's a practitioner like myself, so there's only two of us on the range this time <laughs> in the afternoon. And, of course, myself and Pete, he's, he's actually not a pro, he's an amateur. We're, we we want to see, see him because his clubs are an oddity. So we muscle our way in and start a conversation, have a look at the clubs. And of course, I want to see the speed because he's an amateur com- coming into the game. And I, one of the big things is, you know, if you're a, a, a young pro who hopes to have 10 or 15 years of a career ahead of you, it's going to be tough if you're going in there without speed because the guys behind you are coming with speed. So it's going to be hard to beat 100 guys who are 180 mile an hour. So I wanted to see, and he's hitting shots, and he's all about accuracy. So he's knocking them out there at that stage at like 170 ball speed. So I said, well, give me one at your best. 
So he turns around and knocks one out there, 182, 184, just like that. And it's a slightly different swing. So it's not his quite one plane swing. I says, well, you know, you're going to do that when you turn pro. And he looked at me and says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to play this way with my, I said, no, 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 no. If you have 180 mile an hour plus ball speed, you're going to use it because it's such an advantage on tour. And he was dismissal of, of it because he wasn't really, he didn't realize on tour. The fact is, if you have that in your arsenal and there's enough players who are using it, so if there's 10, 15, 20, and now 30 players with 180 plus, all of a sudden, you're not going to give up that advantage you ever have it. Now, Bryson didn't realize that because he was brought up with this face stability, one plane swing. But now he's realizing, look, whatever I've got in my game, I've got to use it. And if I don't have a good week, and that might be the harder one for him going forward. If he doesn't have a good week, what's this, you know, what if he does have a bad week driving in wild? At the moment, it's a honeymoon period. Everything is going well. But you, it will be interesting to see the three or four, maybe five or six guys who are equally as long, will they start letting loose and trying to hit it as far? I mean, equally as fast, not equally as long. And, and it could ch- I definitely believe it's changed the face of golf. But as regards to drugs, there's so many reasons. The one, he always had speed. And secondly, he's not even close to what's humanly potential in terms of speed. Nobody would think of somebody running 11, 11 seconds for 100 meters as a, as a, as a mm. taken performer. Nobody would think. And, and for all the American people, it's much easier. He's, he's, his golf speed is about 95, 95 mile an hour fastball. He's about 15% less than what we know. Kyle uh, Berkshaw, who's the long drive guy, he's got 231 mile an hour. So, oh God. yeah, that's that's so. So that would be the world record that I've seen. Okay, so Bryson is what close to 35 miles an hour short of that. Hmm. Maybe not on his best day. Say 25 on a on a on a different sort of day. So it's it's not exceptional in terms of long hitting, but it's exceptional in terms of PGA Tour. Mm, very interesting Boric, everybody wants to know how fast did you get it up yourself 196 your... my, 196 was my record this this break I got about four weeks ago but I've I've hit so many balls I, I'm, I'm doing the opposite now so I've gone down the the, the, the power route of bulk I've gone down the power the, the strength route I've gone down the speed route in the gym I always can get speed when I'm hitting consecutive shots what I'm trying to find now is speed every 10 minutes because that's how often you hit the golf ball on the golf course. So I, I, I got some great speeds in this lockdown. I've, I've been continually injured. I've hit so many golf balls. But 196 is, is, is again, it's, I just can't bring that to the golf course. Uh, I, why, why not? Why not? Because uh, I get faster as I hit. And, and it's been a great pro- I, Like At the moment, Regardless of what the shot the Bryson is at, 180 is the threshold at the moment. That's what Rory, that's what DJ, if I can get to 180, not forget the 196, if I can get to 180, that's inefficient. That's Rory, like Rory is exceptionally long and that's what Rory's at. So all I'm aiming for is 180 and I'm, I'm not there. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a weirdo. So essentially, Jesus, you're, yeah. you're coming out with a lot of comments about yourself today. So, well, <laughs> look, I, I can stand there and I've done this in testing. I can hit drivers flat out for five hours. I've seen this happen and I'm still getting faster after five hours. I would make the marathon runner of driving. I would be that guy. And I can get up tomorrow and hit again. Whereas most guys, I, I, most professional golfers, if they hit 20 drivers, they'd be, oh, that, I, I They'd struggle the next day. I could hit a thousand drivers and physically, okay, it would slow me down the next day, but I could certainly play the next day. But I just, the key in professional golf is to be fast every 10 minutes, as in every, you know, when you have to hit a tee shot and I'm not there. I'm, I, the fastest I've ever been on the golf course is 178 when I was working with George Gankis. Uh, and it was comfortable. The fastest, as I said, 196 at home. I, I'm trying. I'm, I, 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 I've been playing like, and, and but I haven't played much because I'm kind of injured at different times. But I, I, I hope to get to the 180. I really do. But it, again, if I got 175 consistently, that's play, like that's what Shane Larry is. Shane's a great driver at 175 because he's accurate 
good ball flights, efficient, and he's won seventy five. That works very well. You know, uh, he he he's going to he's he's he generally gains off the tee because of the fact the combination of accuracy and a decent length gives him a a, a good strokes gained off the tee, and that's kind of where I would be aiming at. In, uh, Is there anybody else on tour that's as big a speed nerd as you? No. Nobody. No, wow. need, no, no. It, it, I, is there as big a nerd on tour? Nobody <laughs> thinks about golf like Porrick. Nobody. Well, Boy. maybe Ronan is caddy, but I would. Geez, you would if myself and Ronan can have a good discussion and or argument over it. His opinions would be would be different to my opinions in terms of 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 things. And uh, he's been giving me a few uh, lectures of in the last while. Uh, you know, to get my. Uh, my finger out and concentrate on playing golf now, whereas I've all, I've always been somebody who's concentrating on playing golf in the future. Yes, uh, which he's kind of saying, well, you're running now a year, so <laughs> the few, five five years time is no use to you. By the way, I'll be a senior by the time the Ryder Cup comes around. I, you know that that's what struck me as well. This is a costly extra year for you, and and the way you're talking, you're still so passionate about the game. I don't know what you were watching Sky Sports last night, but the Open Chronicles was on, and you were there. And even oh. though I've seen it about twenty five times, I was like, I'm going to sit down again. And uh, lest yeah. we need reminding, I mean, you did set off in the final round of an Open with a fifty nine year old in 08. So, like, do you do you daydream or even visualize or think to yourself? You know, right week, feeling good. There's one more in me, you, you know, because I wouldn't write you off. <laughs> what do you, of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell my wife this, but every night, when I, the last thing I think about when I go to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Laurie. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, Peter, it, Peter's it, actually said that quite a lot, because we would often, when discussing your career right now, Potter would say you look like you're in a place where you're you know enjoying being out on tour and you get into contention the odd week and Peter would always make the point he is not happy just being out on tour he still is desperate to be in contention and desperate to win yeah I I, I think Peter would have seen it the last couple of years Peter was out I was coming back to Europe and I used I, I changed my personality to survive out on tour so essentially the competitiveness on tour yeah I want to win but it's tough it's tougher for me out there there's a like most weeks, even in the first round, I might have an eight footer on the eighth hole, and like if I miss it, I'm I'm like thinking, oh god, I'm on the cut line, I'm going to miss the cut. You know, whereas when you're in a comfort zone, you're not thinking like that because you know you're making the cut. You know you're going to be just hang in there. You're going to be in the top ten at the end of the week. You're going to be in contention. Now, you know it's very tight for making cuts, and I'm I'm just not as I don't have that wiggle room. I don't have that comfort. But what I've found is, and I, I, I did find it hard three or four years ago, but what I found is, you know what, if I enjoy my life on tour more, and, and, and Peter would have seen this because in those years, just uh, unfortunately Peter was finishing up and Damien at the Damien McGrain at the same time, I would have made much more of an effort to go out and socialize and be out there with the lads because I realized that it was tougher on the golf course, but it was actually great fun off the golf course. And, and that was bringing me bringing the enjoyment back into the lifestyle and the game, which extends a career. I think a lot of guys who have burnt out, and you could have said that four or five years ago, I might have been burnt out. But the way to extend it is to understand, hey, I love doing what I do. I love being out there. Not necessarily at the moment with, the, with COVID and that, but I love being out there uh, with what's, all that's going on, the, the, the fun, being out with the lads. Tell them, tell the truth. You love the gossip and the slagging and the discussions. Yeah, that you know, and and, and that it is. It's all about that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been a great person to know the gossip. So Peter and Damien and people like that. Damien was the quiet man. Would know, would know everything that's going on. If you ask the right questions, he didn't know. He 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 didn't tell you much. Uh, but yeah, it, look, I have a lifestyle out in tour that nobody would turn down you know i i can choose pick and choose when i play golf tournaments i i can go all around the world the golf courses are the best why would i give up playing that you know and that's kind of three four years ago i did some commentary i like doing that i like doing the coaching as you see but then i sit back and go what do i actually like playing and it mightn't go as well as i want i do believe i can i do believe i can i and and i know this is a cliche and it, Nobody's hit more golf balls in the last 12 weeks than me. Nobody has. I, I have, like, I have 
basically put my body under the, the worst stresses because I've just hit dry and only drivers. I've hit nothing else. Just drivers. All and, day. And, and you've given, hold on a second, you've given thousands of people things to work on. All, yeah. all your Twitter videos have been superb. I tell all, you, all the people up there, are loving us. I, I, I'm watching them all up here in the range, watching yeah. you know, holding their finishes and the whole lot. So, you could uh, collect yeah. them. In, you could collect them into a 64 DVD set. Yeah, I, I actually, said that to him. I said I'm that to him. I know. I'm going to do. I'm actually going to do a YouTube. I'm going to put them. All, I'm going to do each one of those videos in an extended format so that they they're basically a bit more explanation on on them all or or at least collate each sort of division of them, whether it's short game or, or, or long game. I, mm. I, I do appreciate the, the retainer check that Peter sends me every, every week <laughs> from there. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it is incredible, put, Potter. Um, you, should put the, you should do it properly. Like, yeah. I, presu- I, I presume at least half a dozen production companies have called you and said, let's do the definitive golf instruction video with you, or have they? No, and I wouldn't do it. Go on. I texted I, I, them to say to do it. Yes. Peter yeah. was talking to me about, I am doing a, I will do a YouTube channel and I will put my stuff up and I'm doing it with a production company. I'm doing it, doing it right. But I, books and, and things like, I, 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 I yes, will I do a book? Yes. At some stage, but I, 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 they're terrible. They're difficult things to do books in the sense of, you know, all the publishers want is a new book. So once your book is done, they're moving to the next book. They don't really, they're, they're oh God, going to damn all estate agents out there. You know, it's not a great, it's not important for them to sell. If they sell 2000 books, it's not that important to sell 2001 books. If you know what I mean, it's better to get another publisher and sell two or another author and sell another 2000 books. So it's, I, I just, I feel if I'm going to do stuff like that, it's a tough thing to do. I will do it. But I think the perfect, medium for me has been the instagram twitter just to put my thoughts out there Hmm. as i feel rather than to build up uh, and remember it's distinctly different coaching an elite player than coaching the weekend warrior and this is the i i and i hope this comes across in my video i think we've got lost in that most of the most of the media that's put out there so if you go on instagram or, or things like that all the coaching like to lay the club down in the downswing, you can't, that's, this stuff is, this is high end, you know, real niche stuff. And, and, and Peter will tell you, even the best coaches in the world can't decide on what's a good golf swing. Hmm. Well, they might decide on what's a good golf swing. But again, if you go and pick the top five players in the world, they'll all have different golf swings. And each one of them, you wouldn't copy the whole thing. They all have things going on that you go, well, you know, let's you can pick Rory as world number one. Rory has the best swing in the world, but he's he swings five six degrees up and to the right. There's no coach will teach you that. You know that that is it. They will they will not teach you to swing up. You know every coach will go ball dynamics. Let's have you swing in zero and zero or, or within one of the, of the directions. Whereas Rory's five six up and he's the best driver in the world, and yet that would not be coached. Monty was the best ball striker in my day. That's not going to be coached. Yes, I think everything Tiger Woods done would have been coached. Uh, but, like, DJ has the crooked hand at the top. That's not going to be coached. Uh, you know, Brooks has a very solid no-hip turn. Again, for good luck with that if you're 50 years of age and you're trying to hit the ball over 150 yards. You ain't going to do it with a, with a, with. With Brooks's hip turn, John Ram has the has the short back swing, which is probably of all of them that might look different to a lot of people, but that would be the most effective for most amateur golf swings. Is John Ram's short and snappy swing would really work very well for for your your regular weekend golfer. But you must realize at this stage that you are now the unpaid coach to thousands of amateur golfers all over Ireland and beyond. And so like during lockdown, so I spend an awful lot of time, say watching your clips, but also say the likes of Nick Doherty's Tea Time Tips, which I really like. And then I'm thinking, why is Harrington not on Sky Sports giving exactly this kind of tips to the viewer? It's the non-elite golfer. That's, that's the audience they'd be chasing. Yeah, look, you see, I wouldn't be doing it on my terms. Right. And, 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 and once you step into that line, it's now becoming commercial. 
So, you know, as in, if I go, if I want to go, if, if a production came, company came and said, well, okay, well, we're now talking terms. What are the terms? How, how would we do it? I did try and start, I had an idea for a, a production. I know it's kind of been done before where you get, a, say, a tour coach, you get a PGA coach, you get a player, uh, you can pick a few, and we'd all get two or three amateurs to go off and teach and we'd have a competition to see who does the best job. I wouldn't mind doing something again. That would be on my terms. Mm. But it, it's difficult when you start working with, with, with TV companies, you know, uh, you know, there, there wouldn't be the financial incentive for me to go and have to do, put in the production time to do it for a TV company. They, they're not going to ultimately, uh, as, even though I don't get paid uh, to do Twitter or Instagram, I still get a return from my profile and from my, you know, my image being built up. And 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 look, I, I, when you I, this is to, to my eternal frustration over the years. Let's face it, when you're getting shown on TV, when those TV groups are being picked out on TV, you know the ones that show each player and mm. this that the other, they're picked based on how well you're doing at that moment in time in professional golf. And then your profile. Yeah, it's why Phil is still, you know, I mean, he's, he's marquee and we we'll yeah. watch him. And I do remember you coming on the Sunday paper review and saying, I'm here for my profile, which was one of the great admissions of any guest. Who's, uh, <laughs> yeah. who's well, what, when you say you're doing a book, by the way, did you mean an instruction book or are you and Kimmage doing a reveal all autobiography? Uh, Kimmage is on at me to try and do that. <laughs> that, that was, I, think, uh, I think I would let Kimmage down. I don't think there would be enough reveal all. There wouldn't be enough juice in it for him to get into. Well, <laughs> we've literally seen your back garden now, which is all he's interested yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you think he's always like Paul is trying to get to the the real story. Mm. So you know, and and do you think, you know, from my point of view, I I, I don't know what my real story is, but you know, as with all autobiographies, they're a very sanitized version of the person. Paul yeah. doesn't want to do a sanitized version. I don't know what the difference is. I'm not saying that I have a great, I have a dark history behind me somewhere. I, I'm not saying that at all. But uh, I definitely would, you got to think I would do it at some stage. But I, I would like, the one that I haven't done, so I've done, well, I haven't done the book, obviously. I, I, I've done the coaching now. I'm trying to do that. But I, 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 I'd be more interested in the psychology book. Mm, of, you of, of, should, yeah. But I, I tried that on the Twitter and it's completely lost on Twitter and Instagram. When I tried to go down the road of, hey, here's my best shots, here's my worst shots. That was me tipping my, my, my toes in the water of, you know, this is what you should be doing mentally. This is how you would handle. And, and when I'm doing corporate stuff, like, if, you know, if I, I spend more time on the mental side of stuff mm -hmm. because it gets by him, but it, it didn't on Twitter or that. Like they were really... Like I could see the numbers. No, people weren't interested in, in me giving them a... Yeah, it's poss possibly more niche and, and uh, less attention grabbing when you've got like other stuff either side of you on Twitter, which is, you know, uh, uh, fireworks going off. And um, just because I wanted to, I knew you were coming on. So I was watching the Open Chronicles last night and it's 08 and, you know, God, you're playing such like unbelievable golf. I mean, Jesus, 08 is, is mad. Um, did you and Norman talk much in that final round? Because you, you said, for people who didn't see it last night, you said on the piece, you're not a sentimental person, but, you know, the media, everyone, it was like, Norman, is go are the golfing gods going to give him one more, you know? And he's kind of an icon. Did you, did you and him talk much in that final round in 08? I wouldn't say we... we I wouldn't say we had a big ch chat going around. I was shocked at how nice he was. I didn't expect that. You know, my image of Norman was much, much tougher, harder man. And I thought going out that day that I was going out there with somebody who was, this is my last chance. You know, I'm going to do everything in my power, you know, really be steely eyed focus. And I, I'm definitely worried about the sentimental side, but really I thought he'd be, but he was just nice. Right. He was just very nice. You know, and I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say he was happy to be there, but, but it's possible that, that he was. You know what? You know, you, you sometimes get. I, I, I love this. If you get into a playoff, you sometimes get into a playoff with a guy who's happy to be there. Like, 
you know, that, that's, that, that's the best guy to be competing against because he, he's already won his tournament, you know, and he's not up for it. Uh, and it kind of, I, I was, maybe it was me, I just thought he'd be a harder, tougher competitor on the day, but he couldn't have been nicer. Couldn't have said good. He couldn't have, it, it, kept, it kept coming across to me. And I, I, always, I just felt that he, he was, if I hit a good shot, he'd say good shot, but was appreciative of the good shot. He was encouraging. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I wasn't expecting it. You, know, mm-hmm. you could say, look, at 59 years of age, he's mellowed as a person, but he was an absolute gentleman and seemed happy at the end that I had won. You know, uh, it, 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 you know, I kind of felt going out there that you're getting a guy here who's going out here, this is his last chance. This is, you know, do or die. And, and you know, if he ain't going to win, he's going to take everybody down with him sort of thing. You know, this yeah, is... Yeah. But he, he, he was brilliant. To play. And you can never underestimate... And I played in other majors coming down the stretch or, or final rounds. And you, you, again, like, you get bad rhythm, get a bad person in the group, get somebody who, who, you know, it doesn't help. It really, when you get somebody you're friendly with, you can talk to somebody who is encouraging, somebody who is good spirited, it rubs off and, and you both can play well. And, and I've, I've seen both sides of it where it just, uh, you know, and, and I, I, could, I look back now, throughout my career, I, was, I would have had a reputation of being a slow player, but a lot of the time was I was a struggling player. So, you know, if you hit it in the rough, miss the green, chip it up to 15 feet or eight feet and you grind over the eight footer, that takes longer than hitting on the fairway, hitting on the green and two put. And so, so a lot of times I, I would be, so I probably wasn't the best player for people to play with over the years myself, but I would have been aware and I'm distinctly aware of the group's rhythm. And, and, and for me now, if I was going out in the last group with somebody, I'm actually hoping that they play well and make birdies. Because I, I know a, a, a rising tide lifts all ships. And I know if he's making birdies, there's chances I'm going to make birdies. And look, if we can get away from the field and slug it out between ourselves over the last four holes. And, and let's face it, over the last four or five holes, there's never much said at that stage but sure. on the front nine you can build a nice and I felt Norman was, was brilliant that brilliant for me that day but not what I expected right, right. Pork, nice. can I can I can you satisfy one thing as someone who has spent so many years so articulately expressing the psychology of sport and being able to analyze it as well as you do when you went into the burn the second time at Carnoustie what was going on like how did like how did you manage to get your head square again. Okay, so I, 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 I have told this story. I, I might have told it on one of my tweets as well, but I'm going to give it to you now. So I hit the tee shot, and that is the worst tee shot I've ever hit in my life. Okay, what you saw on TV makes it look much better than it was. So <laughs> it really was bad. Now, and, and, and if anything, one tee shot, even though I went on to win two majors afterwards, did inordinate damage to my driving. Okay, to, to stand on the 18 tee box with such confidence and hit such a bad shot. I broke my golden rule after that. So after I hit, I, I'm sorry I'm getting distracted here, but we are talking psychology. So to be a good player, and anybody, here's my first tip that I should be putting out on Twitter. I don't generally want to give the elite players tips, but if you want to be a good player, when you hit a bad shot, if your first point of analysis is how did I do mentally? How did I do routine-wise to hit that shot? You will be a lot better a player than if your first point is, what did I do physically? What did I do with my swing? Because it usually is the mental process that caused the physical issue, not mm-hmm. the other way around. So bad players will go to the physical first, whereas good player in a good run will go to the mental. So I was very much what I did mentally. But after I, uh, for the years after that, I was trying to fix my mental issue on that tee box by fixing, a, by having a golf swing. So I went to try and get a golf swing that, if I focused badly, would still work. Instead of just going, oh, that was just a mental error. Let's get a golf swing that, if I focus well, it works. And, and in many ways, I broke my mental side chasing that physical side. 
after that. But anyway, let's go back to the T-shirt. I hit the worst T-shirt ever. I walked off that tee box and I put my chest up in the air and said, anybody can hit a bad shot. Fine. And remember, the only reason I hit it right is because I was so confident. I got a small amount of doubt at the top of my backswing. And if you're confident and you get doubt, it can manifest itself into an explosion. Whereas it, normally if you're unconfident, if you've really got a lot of fear, you're expecting the worst. So when you get a little bit of doubt, you're expecting it. You're not going to react. So anyway, I overreacted a bad shot. Go down there. I made a tactical error. So I have 258 to the flag. Down off the right wind. I have out of bounds left. If I pitch the ball on the green, it's going to go out of bounds. If I hit it long, it's going to go out of bounds. If I hit it short, it's in the water. And if I hit it right, I can't get up and down. So I have the worst shot you could ever ask anybody to hit. And you wouldn't go for it. I decide to drop close. So to leave myself 258, I dropped at the front of the, just behind the, the penalty area. God, I can't get used to that. And what I actually did was the mistake. I dropped in a light bit of grass that the grain was going against me. I should have gone back 20 yards and hit a wood off the fairway. It was a tactical error. I hit another bad shot, which was magnified by the lie I dropped. And bear in mind, I was only trying to hit it to the front of the green because that's the only space I had. I wasn't trying, and it's come up short and gone in the water. And for the first time in my life, ever on a golf course, I was embarrassed. I've never, ever had this experience. So I, I have, I'm the one that I, I do things on the golf course and I just, look at people who criticize and I'm I'm very much that guy you know the hurlers in the ditch I couldn't care less about them you're not out here you're not in the arena and I really it really drives me to people who think like that so but this was the first time I was ever embarrassed on the golf course because I choked mm. I, I felt like I choked I had a one shot lead it was my open and bear in mind I was playing great so it wasn't like I was coming in it wasn't like I was feeling bad I was feeling great and I've just hit two horrible shots I've lost the open. I wanted to give up. Never been that way before. So if they could have stopped it, if the ground could have opened up and swallowed me up, that was fine. I would have walked in. Mm. Now, I'd been working with my caddy and Bob Rotella. I've been working with Ronan and Bob Rotella on this very thing because this was the last piece of the jigsaw. We knew we were playing good enough golf. So we were working on Ronan's interaction with me very much the mental side, what Ronan was doing. So Ronan started into the cliches. It's not over yet. One shot at a time. Let's finish it out. You know, and he just kept hitting me with these cliches. And they are cliches. Nobody's going to invent anything at this stage that's, not, that's new. There is nothing new in psychology. So he starts into it. Now, I do believe he took the four iron off me because I was going to wrap it around his neck. Okay, I was. I've never been this way on the golf course. But Something strange happened. If you remember, I had those mad eyes. When I've got that adrenaline and fear, I have those. So for 50 yards, I wanted to give up. For the next 50 yards, Ronan just kept at me. Just kept at me. And for some reason, after 100 yards, I was listening. And by the time I got to the golf ball, which wasn't much more than 180 yards, I actually got back into the zone, which is like I struggle i want to find other sports people to ask them this question to be in the zone is special to drop out of the zone and to come back into it i don't know i i've never experienced that before and by the time i was hitting my chip shot it was 48 yards i hit that chip shot like a teenager showing off to his mates that's what i was doing i fired it in there really low and the whole crowd you could hear the the, sh <gasps> the shock of the crowd because they thought i'd knife this thing because it was coming in so low and so hard. But remember, it was back pre-2010, and I had those very special groups. <laughs> and this thing came, came in there and just spun up to about six feet behind the hole. And I, it was showing off, just like a kid, just showing off. It was one of the most surreal experiences ever, the position I was. And I lost it a little bit. Like, when I went to hold the six-foot putt, if you remember, Sergio's putt didn't break. There was only a half a cup to aim at because the way the, the hole was cut, anything left was staying left and anything right was breaking right. Mm. So you, you'd basically, as pure as the chip was in terms of the mental side, the putt was 
absolutely willpower. Nothing else. It was just grinding willpower to get it in the hole. And again, once I hold the putt, I got the same emotions that I had after I'd hit the bad shot. It was all over. I'd lost. I was devastated when I, when I was walking off that green. And my son ran onto the green. Paddy is three and a half, uh, who won his, comp- won his medal today. Paddy's a qualified cameraman at this day. <laughs> well, there, there, is an up, there is an upside. He's had to listen to all my lessons. And there's, no, there's, 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 no, there's no way he would have listened to all those lessons. And, and, look, and I, w- I will say this. The only goal I have for both of my kids when it comes to golf is that they look like they can play. Yeah. Because clear, clearly the following, but they're going to have to look the part. At 30 years of age, they're going to play in some outing. People are going to stop and watch. So they have to look good. And because of the one, and this is the one that people might have missed out on in my lessons, which is so important. My son now waggles his feet and, the, and his hands. So he waggles the club and he moves his feet before he hits the ball. So he looks like a player. Mm. He's, 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 a, he's a high handicapper. He's 20-something shots. But he waggles and moves. So forever he will look the part. Oh, yeah. and, and people don't realize how important it is. Beginners, bad amateurs move their knees, whereas pros move their feet to get ready. So you, 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 you've got to move your feet a little bit. You've got to move your hands to prep yourself to balance yourself, to steady yourself. Hmm. So, he, he, so all those lessons, the payback is my son has had to listen to me. So I, I'm delighted about that. But going back to this, he runs on the green. I pick him up and he couldn't care less. He looked at me like I was a winner. I was a star. He was three and a half. He knew he didn't know I'd, lo- I'd lost. He had no idea. And again, I went from thinking I'd lost to changing my mindset. He was happy with me. It wasn't the end of the world. It felt like the end of it, but it wasn't. I went in and signed, I, I'm sorry to drag it out the story. I went in and signed my card. And Clive Brown, who was my Walker Cup captain, was actually the recorder. And as I come in, not that they should have been expecting me, they have the TV on playing a replay of me, my last hole with the commentators giving the commentary of what a disaster Harrington has made. So as I'm coming in the door, there's a mad scramble to hit the remote control. Oh, shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew what was going on. I signed my card and I asked him to turn it back on because I needed to watch Sergio. Now, I turned it back on with the volume down. And let nobody tell you. And it's the same, I would think, with all sporting occasions. When you actually win, you do things that aren't perfectly controllable, that aren't repeatable. I sat in that room watching Sergio with a 10-foot putt in the last. And bear in mind, Sergio was the best driver in the world at that stage. Easily the best driver, and he hit an iron off the last. So like he kicked the can down the road. He had a great second shot to put it in the bunker. Good third shot. He's got that 10-footer for par. I sat watching him hit that 10-foot putt. And not once did I wish for him to miss, even though I knew he needed to miss for me to be in a playoff. I sat there and just kept telling myself I was going to win. Now, logically, that meant he had to miss. But I kept telling myself, I'm going to win this Open. And when he missed, I didn't get a high or a low out of it. Mm. It was just... And, and when you see me come back out to the hole, I'm very much business as usual. I wasn't the guy who was happy to be in the playoff. You know the way I t- mentioned that earlier? That's the worst guy in the world because his, his mojo, his adrenaline is gone. I stayed constant. I had no good or bad karma. I had none of that. I just was constant. I was going to win. And again, I know we're dragging out the mental side a bit here, but if you're going to set a goal of doing something, most people would set a goal of doing something and put conditions on it. So most people say, I'm going to win this playoff by birdie in the first. I was going to win the playoff. I didn't care if I made four double bogeys. In my head, I was going to win. I was going to do what it takes to win. Regardless of how I was going to win, I was going to do it. And this is what I'm talking about, circumstantial. Going down the first hole, we both hit our tee shots. And as we're walking about 100 yards off the tee, we both hit them, say, 240, 250. And and it was a small black cloud. One real thunderstorm rain cloud came across the sun. sun. And the temperature dropped 5 degrees. It probably felt like it dropped more than 5 degrees. And having played the week before at the European Club, I'd seen the, those storms coming in at the European Club where the weather changed. 
and I'd recognize that, hey, when the temperature drops like that, the golf ball doesn't go as far. So if you look at that playoff, Sergio was two clubs short with his second shot into that green. Like it bounced into the bunker. Like he was a good 15-yard short carry, if not 20. He misjudged his distance so much. I took an extra club, hit it a little harder than I expected, and only got the pin high, all because the temperature changed. You can't predict this stuff. You can't, mm. you know, they, people keep trying to pretend that anybody who wins a golf tournament or a major has some inordinate control over their game or event. What they have is the ability to get themselves in position to win. The actual winning depends on good breaks, bad breaks, avoiding them, and other people. But the, the skill is being there, as Tiger did. And, and going to Tiger, this killed me about Tiger. Tiger in 2000 was unbelievable to play with. He hit golf shots on the golf course that were just spectacular. By the time 2004 came along, he didn't do any of that. He just played safe all the time because he knew it was a numbers game. He had the ability to be in contention all the time by being steady because he was so good at that. But the guy who was there in 97, 98, 99, that was... And you're, if, you, if, you, if they're going to show a highlights of Tiger now in his spectacular shots, you'll see a few from nowadays because he has to go for it more. And the other ones you'll see from 2000 and prayer because... He, he, he was raw talent then. He became so... He didn't have the competition to push him, is the reality. He didn't have enough people making him go for it enough because when he went for it, we see those shots like the Canadian open over the water. They're the shots he could hit. And he wasn't pushed into that that often. He played a numbers game of being safe, knowing that the more times he's in contention, he can either make something happen which he didn't have to that often. He did against me in 2009 at Bridgestone. That four iron he hit. Uh, was that four iron he hit into 16 to about two feet? Uh, it was like, I don't know you guys might remember, but 2009, I remember it. Like, it was one of the greatest shots ever. From like, uh, it wasn't a four iron actually, it was, but it was like 190 yards over water. It was a shot over water from like 190 yards. You didn't fancy hitting a wedge over it from like 100 yards. Uh, so he could do that. And I think that scared his opponents so much at times that they messed up chasing him. And he realized that, so he just, just played steady. Uh, it, it was, and beautiful at it. But I like, I like the fact now he's forced into hitting a few more shots hmm. now. Hmm. There's about 30 questions we could ask you in follow-up to that answer. Well, I, I thought it was great. Peter just gave up halfway through yeah. and literally hung <laughs> up. Peter Laurie just left. He literally just bailed. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, thanks so much for your time. I will we'll pick that up with about, there's about 20 other questions I want to ask you. I want to start, next time you're on, I'm just going to, I don't care what you're on to talk about. I just want to ask you about Sergio after that 07 um, major, because I suspect it was very difficult for him and he, you know, he, he carried it and everything. But if I start on that now, we'll be here forever. I, 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 all I'd say in Sergio is, you know, 07, it would have been difficult for Sergio. I didn't appreciate it so much in, in 08 when I beat him. You know, second time round, he did, I felt at that stage, and this is what caused some of the controversy, you know, I'm a two-time major winner, you know, I've done it. It's not necessarily that you failed sort of thing. You know, that kind of, we get on well now. Yeah. I, I think obviously he's won a major now, and, and we have a better balance of things, much better balance of things now. But there has to be that mutual respect, if you know what I mean. And, and, and I think, you know, the fact that he's gone on and won his major now, it's made it easier from both sides uh, to see that, look, I said, it is interesting. You know, Sergio was one of our best, certainly best ball striking talents uh, of my era. And, you know, it's hard to come by those majors because there's circumstantial stuff that goes into play, uh, which would be great to watch going forward with Shambo now. You yeah. know, he, he's in that position. And it, it's amazing that a man who's never finished in the top 15 of a major is, is the favourite. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pick all that up again. Again, listen. Um, thanks so much for the time. Jeez, that was brilliant. That was, that was great. And yeah. um, here's to another year and a bit of talking Ryder Cup. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm okay with it at the moment. Yeah, okay. You, you see, yeah, two and a half years of it. Maybe it was it'd be getting a bit too much. But let let's hope. Uh, yeah, look, let's hope we get a great run out of this. Let's hope the times are better and that we're 
as I said, let's even hope in September we're looking at it and saying, hey, things aren't so bad. Yeah, fingers yeah, crossed. Brilliant. Fingers crossed. Padraig Cownan, that is the pod for uh, this week. Thanks again. Thank you, lads.